Hello. Hello, um, hello, hello. Oh, we're on. Hey. Excellent. Sweet. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Welcome to the panel. We have Let's Train an AI to Play a Game. Who's excited? <laughs> well done. Okay, so excellent. Fantastic. All right. So I am soon to be Dr. Meredith Castles. Hey. hey. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm Dr. Tim. I'm Dr. Paris. And I'm Dr. John. Uh, a lot of doctors here. I promise they're enthusiastic. We're enthusiastic. <laughs> we, we're, also, we're also game developers, so we kind of know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, that means we pretend. Yeah, they do pretend. It's yeah, good. We but they pretend well, so that's good. <laughs> Excellent. All so, right. We're from Tasmania, which has better coffee and better internet than Melbourne, but we love you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> thank God the expects a reaction. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> There's spiders here? Yes. <laughs> just, we, we do have to just give you a note here. So uh, this presentation does feature little uh, depictions of eight-legged, really creepy, disgusting creatures. It's not quite as realistic as the, ha the hairy ones, that's, that's all. So uh, they do move in a pretty spidery fashion, so we do have to give you the chance to exit, yeah. <laughs> if you would like. <laughs> okay, it, yeah. we are done. All right. Um, so let's begin. Uh, so what we're going to be talking today is proximal policy optimization, which is the approach we're going to be using. I mean, hopefully this is all pretty bog standard stuff. You, it's, you, you your standard yeah. gradient descent. Uh, I mean, the, the main thing here is theta in this case is um, the policy parameter. Epsilon is actually probably the more interesting one, mm -hmm. really. It's the hyperparameter. You should have that somewhere realistically set between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. Uh, no, just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is actually what we're doing, but we're not going to talk about it like that. Um, <laughs> this is hopefully about as complex as we're going to get. Uh, we want to keep the maths at hopefully the stonks level. Um, and if not, you know, we'll see. Fantastic. So these are the things you will expect to see in this talk. So we do have some giant walking robots. OK, creepy ones. Laser guns, explosions, graphs. Um, humanity destroyed by the machines, computer science, and probably some more graphs. Excellent. So let's get started for real. <laughs> Promise for real. OK. What do we think about when we think about AI? I don't know. So when they think of AI, they probably think of this. <laughs> OK, so you've got robot characters in films, both good and bad. Depends on how you fall on that little fence. Um, OK, we also have in games, we think of beloved characters such as Claptrap. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and reefers from Mass Effect, obviously. Or things like this. <laughs> Where an AI was apparently used to write movie scripts and menus. Note, none of these things are AI. <laughs> in fact, they're all 100% human controlled, made. And in the case, especially of the movie script and menu, uh, they're both 100% written by Keaton himself. <laughs> so no AI involved at all. They are very funny, though. <laughs> yeah, <hilarious. laughs> that is true. What That's we usually true. call AI is actually just a collection of rules that things follow. So they're just a list of steps, and the thing follows the steps, and then it kind of looks like it's got a behavior. Uh, we're mostly faking things in the way that humans actually behave in the real world, where humans solve complex problems by following a list of tasks. So computers are very good at following lists of tasks. So they can do things like identifying objects like this. They're not always reliable. Uh, in this example, <laughs> a pattern of noise was overlaid on top of this picture of a cat, and the AI, which job was ostensibly to identify pictures of things, whether they were cats or not, decided with 100%, nearly 100% confidence that this was guacamole and not a cat. Uh, if it helps, rotating the picture, I think it's nine degrees, it becomes a cat again. <laughs> yeah. So computers are very easy to fool, especially when they're given a list of rules to follow, and they're not actually that intelligent. Notice the hashtag. Yeah. So we're going to actually talk about how AI in games generally works. AI. AI. What happens is a human, like one of us, sits down and writes a whole bunch of code for the rules of what the thing actually needs to do. Uh, you could effectively sit there, read that code, and figure out what the thing needs to do and could do in any circumstances. It's not AI. It's just a set of rules, sometimes called a heuristic. Just a bunch of steps, basically a recipe to follow. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today, specifically for those who really care, is we're going to be looking into reinforcement learning and artificial neural networks. And that's, these are the two like hotness in AI currently. 
So um, basically, the way this works is it's, uh, they say it's inspired by the way our brains work. They've taken a lot of liberties. Our brains are actually really complex. Uh, neural, artificial neural networks were invented in the 1950s by a bunch of really clever scientists. That's the scientists there, if you don't know what they look like. <laughs> uh, and the idea is they work very similar to our brains. So our neurons, we've got you know, billions to trillions of these neurons in our brain. Some neurons uh, connect up to, say, your eyes, so they send eye signals down. Others connect up to, say, your tongue, they send taste signals down. Then you might have other neurons that say connect your hands. That's why my hands are moving around like an idiot because my like hand neurons are going, move like an idiot, move like an idiot. Uh, and if you connect enough of these neurons together and you connect them in the very specific correct way, you effectively get intelligence. And that is the same for both artificial neural networks and uh, human neural networks. Although there's a lot of complexity in the artificial ones we're just sort of ignoring. So sorry, biologists. <laughs> Um, the thing is, that's all actually really tricky to visualize, both in the real brains and the artificial brains. So the, the kind of the three really important bits you care as, both as like a flesh creature and as like our robot overlords, uh, is you really care about the actions, so what you can do. Uh, so as a human, you can actually do quite a lot, which is, you know, that's good. Uh, <laughs> observations, so what you know. So humans actually have a lot of great observations. We've got eyes, we've got ears, we've got touch sensors, we've got heat sensors, we've got... Uh, accelerometers, it, 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 we got right. lots. Moral lots, compass. Lots, Moral yeah. compass, yep. um, <laughs> some people. Um, and most importantly, we have rewards. And this is true both in the artificial and the human sense. Rewards are the reason why you do things. You really want to get the rewards. So in this case, our rewards are lovely minties. Um, and the idea is by uh, hooking observations up into actions in the right way, it can eventually learn the actions to take to get the most rewards. So you can actually basically just trick by you know, continually hitting the robot with a combination of carrot and stick uh, to do things, which is uh, exactly the same as with people. You hit them the right way, uh, or give them the right rewards, they do the right thing. So <laughs> don't hit people. <laughs> uh, so realistically, all an AI actually is is a reward maximizer. It wants as many minties as it can get. Uh, and basically, we do that by setting it up, pushing it off, and then letting it work out how to do it itself. It just keeps uh, maximizing that reward, actually using that big, long, complex function at the start. So there's a little bit of math, but you never have to worry about it. <laughs> so to show you how a modern AI is trained, we're going to do one here live on stage. All right. All right. With John. With John Boss. We'll, we'll get to have an it. actual computer soon, we promise. <laughs> We're going to train an AI who's, who is John at the, at the end here, that he should walk forward and reach a goal. Nice and simple. All right. I'm okay. going to walk forward. Brilliant. I'm going to walk backwards. Give me the minty. <laughs> I'm going to walk forward. Have a minty. Nice. I'm going to walk forward. Have a minty. Yes. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. So... Excellent. The outcome of this. Fantastic. Okay. Now, I promise you that was real legitimate AI. Now, given that I've been effectively trained uh, with the appropriate rewards and actions and observations, plus Mike, what action do you think I would take next after that? Mostly forwards. Ooh. I heard some backwards. <laughs> yeah. that, that could have happened as well, but mm -hmm. mostly forwards. And in fact, it's the average of all the possible actions that could be selected from that uh, controls where I'm going to be doing, uh, going to next. So that's reinforcement learning with me and Minties. So that was super simple and totally not degrading to John, who is a professional scientist and game developer. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try and not do that again to John. <laughs> But now that we do know the principles of how we make a thing move, sorry, John, um, <laughs> let's, make, let's see if we can actually put that in a video game context. Cool, all right. So, uh, the way this is going to work is it's actually going to be pretty similar. We're going to create a virtual environment. We do that in Unity. Uh, we're going to tell the robot some facts. The facts it knows is how far away it is from the target. So we're going to make it move towards the target. Uh, John's target was me. The robot's target will be an orange cube. We're then going to let the update uh, take some actions. Um, and initially it's going to drive like a jerk, but it should eventually figure it out. And then we're going to reward or punish the robot depending on how well it drives. So the closer it gets, the more minties it gets. The further away it gets, we take minties off it until it has negative minties. And there's nothing worse than that. <laughs> All right. So let's go to demo. All right. So what we have here is we've got our little robot on the right-hand side of the screen. We have its juicy target on the left. And it is set up to know about the distance from 
itself to the target at, at all times, and it has the ability to either roll forward or roll backwards. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell the robot to begin training. I'm going to quickly hop over to here and tell it to put it into training mode. And I'm going to jump into my super high technology um, uh, training system. And what this is doing is it's putting Unity into a mode where it's going to start receiving information from the game engine. So I'm ready to hit play. I'll hit the play button. Uh, so here, and so what you'll start seeing uh, in the darker area of the screen is the robot repeatedly running over and over again, moving closer and jumping around. This is running at 100 times speed, and also the lag you're seeing is because it doesn't really care about displaying a good thing, it's just caring more about um, the, performing the research. So if I go over this here... This is really what AI is, just looking at charts and going like, oh, yeah. wow, so, why is that so We're going to sit here for a second and we're going to look at the chart. What we're looking at here is the total amount of uh, reward that this agent has received over time, the total number of minties. And you notice like, it started fairly low and it kind of went up and has kind of stabilized around about the, the 12 to, to 15 uh, area here. Okay. You've all heard of good screen and bad screen. AI is basically good chart and bad chart. Yes, <laughs> yes. we like the good chart. We don't like, oh. what, uh, we, we don't like this chart. This is the bad chart. And the uh, bad chart, yeah. no, we don't like it being low. Actually, no, we, we, mm. we, we, we want it to be low. Um, no, you want entropy to be low. We actually want, okay, yeah. I'm actually going to add one more time because I noticed that the rewards are actually not what I want it to be. So I'm going to do it one more time. We train um, a bad robot. One of the ways that we train our robots is uh, all of the weights inside the neural network start out randomized, which means that there is sometimes a chance for the training to actually just fail. Um, so if I just jump back over to our run here, we'll start seeing uh, different numbers. Oh, that's better. Yeah, Good. That's yeah, that's like what that. I like to see. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, brilliant. Cool. All right. So don't worry too much about what that actually was. And in a second... If it helps, every time it succeeds or fails, we kill it. Yeah. I love working with developers. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So now that that's all done, I'm just going to stop that run, and then I'm going to copy the brain that we just trained into the right place. So I'll just copy that into uh, the right folder, and there we go. Brilliant. Okay. Turn off training mode, and now let's see our robot that we have just spent about three minutes of uh, over-explanation uh, <laughs> drive towards its goal. Let's see how well it does now that it's learned. Yeah! Woo! Great of our robot! <laughs> so, we just trained an entire AI. That's the talk, we're done. We're finished. <laughs> uh, with a neural net to solve a problem, which was go to the cube. Uh, we could have saved a lot of time and a lot of electricity uh, instead of training an algorithm, uh, using a neural net to go forward, we could have just told the robot to hold down the forward key, <laughs> which is exactly the same thing. We've massively over-engineered this, because that is what we do, uh, to make a robot that knows how to go forward. So let's try something a little bit more challenging. Let's do this in a more interesting way. We're going to make John, again, <laughs> drink a glass of water. This involves bending arms, which are made of multiple joints. It's a lot more complicated. Okay. Okay. Let's set up John with some water here. Okay, I'm going to step out of the way. All right. Beware, front row, you're in the splash zone. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm ready to be guided. Okay. John, move your shoulder forward four centimeters. Oh, God. Uh, move your shoulder to the right four centimeters. Move your, straighten your elbow out. Move your shoulder up. Stop. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Anyone can help. <laughs> I haven't got the glass yet. Oh, I like it. I like it. Oh, just with, just with the, uh, oh, 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 oh. oh. Sorry? <laughs> Lower the arm. Okay. Now what? Oh, what was that? <laughs> Can we call it? <laughs> All right. Abort. <laughs> Thank you.
So that was the John environment showing us its new skill, drinking a glass of water. <laughs> it's very high tech. And again, we're going to try and not degrade John anymore. But we're really sorry about that. We love John. He's lies. I've got a PhD. He does. <laughs> So John was observing the angle to the glass, updating the angle of joints, and getting rewarded when he eventually did reach the glass of water. It was a plastic cup of water because we didn't actually trust John with glass. Yeah. But um, <laughs> all of you. But we didn't trust me with water, apparently. Yeah. It's different. So that was a much harder thing to do, as you can see. John has a lot of joints in his arms and is quite a complicated creature. Um, you know, very well animated, all that. Uh, to bring this in our game engine, in our game environment, we're going to have a look at how you know, bending physical joints and stuff can be used to train a robot to walk that is not animated or otherwise does not know how to walk. So let's do that now. Cool. So again, we're going to apply the same ideas to our little robot, the little eight-legged creepy robot. Um, we'll teach it how to walk. What's involved in walking, though? So we've got shoulders, elbows. What about legs, though? Yeah. The same amount, all good. So knees, yeah. hips, ankles, yeah, absolutely. If you think about it, legs are just really weird hands. True. <laughs> there is that. Like this is the bit where there's things that look like spiders. So if you yeah. are not a fan of spiders, now is the time to close your eyes or leave. Yep. Do it for me because I can't. that spider like us. Just we've, you know, we've <laughs> tested this a few times and people who don't like spiders might be scared and that's, not, that's fine with yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've built a robot. We've given it eight legs because... We're not that smart. Um, OK, and we're going to teach it to walk to a target object. Um, so uh, kind of like before, what we have to work out what are the three important things that we're going to tell our robot. So for observations, it needs to know where each leg, I'm going to use my arms as legs here, uh, <laughs> where each leg joint currently is positioned, so this, and then angle the target. So if Paris is my target, it's about 90 degrees angle away from me. Uh, the velocity target, so am I currently moving towards or away from Paris? Uh, and the distance to Paris or any other objects. So, you know, I don't want to run into the, the, the lectern mic that makes a big boom, and no one would like that. But I do want to get closer to Paris, so, you know, the distance to Paris is the important thing here. My actions in this case is how much to bend each joint. So, exactly the same like with John, we're going, like, you know, bend arm a little bit, out a bit, you know, so on and so forth. And the rewards are I'm going to, we're going to give our robot more minties if it's facing the right way. Uh, and more minties if it's running closer towards. So we want it to just tear clean towards that cube. Uh, and we're going to make the cube move around this time because, let's be honest, just going forward is boring. All right, cool. So let's take a look at our robot. So here it is. I'm about to hit the play button. It'll take a second to spin up. And uh, so what you're seeing on screen, once it starts moving, is our horrifying robot. <laughs> Again, it's not animated to walk, it's taught itself to walk. Yeah. yeah. So the only thing that it was given knowledge about was the location of the cube and also information about its own body. The only actions that it can take are how much to bend each one of its joints, of which it has 16. And, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, 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 yeah! <laughs> Now, if anyone's ever been hit by a giant high-velocity orange cube, you know how hard that is to recover from that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you like, know, that, that's actually really complex behavior I wanna, there. I want to be clear. We didn't teach it to recover. It learned how to do that itself. We have seen this robot do a number of really complicated behaviors. For example, right now, it's walking around. Uh, it's, it's staying stable. It's able to turn. And you'll notice like, it does kind of like a hopping side-to-side -side motion. We've also seen it like, kick all of its legs out at the same time to do, make a really like hopping turn. It has at times balanced on two legs and use that to turn around. And I've also seen it done a somersault at one point. <laughs> it's also climbed over some of the obstacles sometimes that were smaller, it walked over one. Yeah. So it wasn't really an obstacle, it just clean cleared it. Yeah. It's terrifying. The numbers at the top left-hand corner of the screen here are the, are the rewards that it's getting. So it gets rewarded for uh, facing the orange cube and also for approaching the orange cube. Because because it has as the eight legs and it could move in any direction that it wanted to, uh, it wouldn't actually have to uh, be facing the target in order to walk towards the target. That's kind of a, a consequence of how its legs are set up. It doesn't have feet. So we walk, uh, we as humans can walk forward better because our feet are pointed in a certain direction, whereas this doesn't have feet and so that doesn't really apply. You might notice there's a whole bunch of other environments in the background with exactly the same thing in it. So sometimes the camera lets you see that there's a few. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a whole bunch at the same time. That's because when you're training a neural net, it's best to do as many as you can yeah. in parallel with each other. So the brain that you're training has as many experiences as possible. So yeah. there's actually, what, nine of there's these robots going at once. And it took about 
four hours to learn how to walk, which, yeah. I mean, it doesn't walk perfectly, but, I mean, if anyone's ever seen a toddler, they've been learning to walk for much longer and they fall over a lot more, so... <laughs> yeah. Whoa, cool. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, uh, this actually stabilised its run. I think I think I still have this. Uh, Look, more this graphs. Here. more graphs this time. Woo! Fantastic. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. All right. So this is the recording of the training run that I did uh, about two days ago to make sure that this you know worked. Um, and uh, so you'll notice that. Like, at the bottom, its rewards are actually kind of negative. It was actually so bad at, uh, at facing the target and moving towards the target that it be actually was being punished really, uh, really, really severely. We took away all of its yeah. penalties. But after about 20 minutes, uh, that kind of began to, to, to scale back up again. And then it stabilized around about a, a, a mean reward of about, of about 400. The actual value doesn't matter, but it's more just the, the measure of how, how bad it was compared to how good it is now. So after about three hours, it was good enough. And we, and we, and we stopped the training at about four hours 10 minutes so yeah just going back to our uh, taking away those lovely graphs and go back to our horrifying robot because you know that's actually a bit more cool to watch um like it's really 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 interesting just flicking movements it knows about uh, one thing we didn't mention is it knows that uh, when its feet are on the ground um so that's just a piece of information that it's aware of um and yeah it's honestly i'm i'm Really, really proud of my horrifying robot son. Much like real life, you'll notice that it can never truly achieve success because once it reaches the cube, the cube just moves again. So yeah. <laughs> and during training, we were killing it when it reached the cube. Yeah. So yeah, cool. life it is lives, pain. It lives a harsh life being a robot. Cool. All right. So yeah, that's our robot. Let's move on. All right. <laughs> Did anyone else notice how more creepy the shadow was than the actual robot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not creepy at all, guys. Excellent. Um, okay. Well, brilliant. And now, let's give it a gun. <laughs> uh, so it turns out teaching to kill isn't actually that hard. Um, it's actually simpler to kill than it is to walk. Uh, I'm sure there's some sort of message in there. Uh, we're actually going to give the gun its own little brain, so it's going to be like two brains working together to be a killing machine. Um, read into that what you want. Uh, so the gun's got its own little brain. What does it need to know? What does it need to be punished for? Uh, so the only thing it actually needs to know is which way is it currently facing. Is it facing towards the target? So let's say all of you are its targets. Um, you know, is it currently looking? So no, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Uh, the only actions are should it shoot or not? So, you know, it's not going to want to waste its ammo, even though it's a laser, uh, when it's going to miss. You know, we want it to be, uh, we want it to be very efficient. No one wants, you know, inefficient robot overlords. And the rewards and punishments are going to be, uh, it's going to get points if it successfully, uh, hits, uh, a target, and it's going to be punished if it misses. But other than that, it's pretty much... That's it. It's really simple. Yeah, it's, it's actually a lot simpler, simpler than the walker, yeah. And yeah. training was much quicker. Just as a reminder, the gun is actually a separate AI in this context. So this yeah. is effectively our little walker, which is one AI, and then like a parasitic gun that's kind of going to sit on its head and have its own brain. The walker's going to keep doing its existing thing, and the guns are going to do its new thing, and they're both separate entities. But because they're kind of working together for the same goal, the walker's trying to get the cube, the gun's trying to destroy the cube, they happen to synergize really well. Up. yeah. Cool. All right. So, so what I've done now is I've put the gun on top of it, and we'll just hit the play button and just watch it in action. So, give it a second to start up, and then, all right. So now, um, the control that the control that the uh, that the robot has over it is, you know, it just instantly like one shots every. Uh, it's it's sniping from across the the other side of the map, and I'm going to just zoom out a little bit here so we get a bit of a better context. Um, oops, over here. So, snipe. Snipe, snipe. Yeah, it's honestly pretty horrifying. So, yeah, yeah again, the only information that it, uh, that, that it gets given is angle to target, and then the only control that it has is when to fire or not. So, yeah, as it uh, roams around, it's just uh, taking pot shots at its target, and that is the most horrifying thing I've seen in some time. It, it's, it's a literal <laughs> aimbot. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. It's worth pointing out sometimes it. Uh, oh, well, yeah. Uh, so, oh, oh, you recovered, you jerk. Um, it, it's worth pointing out sometimes it shoots into the ground. That's because mm. it doesn't have control over its own body. The gun uh, sometimes gets pointed down as a side effect of how the walker's walking. So even though it did have a shot, in between it sort of popped down and then hit the ground instead. So it's not perfect, but for something that we trained in less than a day, 
I think it's pretty terrifying. Mm. So again, this is not necessarily how most video game AI actually works, because most video game AI is just a list of rules. This is actually a neural net, and very few video games that we know of are actually doing their AI this way at the moment. That's starting to change, though. So more horrifying gun bots for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So what we have just learned is that robots um, are just awesome at murder. <laughs> so That's good at it. So good. And they're likely to be the death of everybody on the planet. Cheery. I like it. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> that is, unless we can find one bold pilot, one bold pilot, to turn the tide, we are lost. <clears throat> okay. Would our audience plant... Uh, <coughs> James Burns, the editor of uh, Super Jump magazine, please come down. Yeah. Could he have a round of applause? Please? Can we have a round of applause? Yeah. Come on, he's your champion. All right. So we're going to explain uh, how to do this uh, with James. All right, so we're, we're going to pit James against the robot. <laughs> we're going to see who can kill the most cubes. Yep. Mm. So we're not expecting this to be a long-lasting competition. <laughs> Alright, cool. Alright. So we just give we'll give James a second to uh, just get familiar with, uh, with with the target. The robot isn't currently in the scene, so we'll just get yep. Feeling feeling alright? Feeling good, yeah. Feeling yeah. good? Alright. Confident. Okay, so um, do, you, do you wanna drive around and maybe shoot a couple of cubes? Yeah. Uh, uh, try and like just get a feel for like, how, how that how that plays. Alright, cool. Alright. Hope We're you're ready so to try good. and be the uh, <laughs> saviour of humanity. Um <laughs> he, yep. he hasn't killed the cube. Yep. Uh, <laughs> This cube's not even thinking yet. Yeah. I've got All confidence. Right. <clears throat> All right, cool. So, um, so the, uh, this is a score attack game. Um, so the cube will be destroyed by the robot, but, but not, by, uh, not by James, because I didn't write the code to make the cube get destroyed by the human. Um, so, all right, we're feeling ready? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Come on, James. All right, okay, so Come the robot's on. now uh, going after the cube and uh, taking... He's, okay, uh, he's don't shoot the robot. Uh, going around the corner, looks like you may be taking a bit of an angle there. Five to zero keep, currently, oh and no. James is oh, come on. scooting around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that one, it's behind bricks, it won't okay, get Okay, all right, here oh, we go, no. okay. Yeah, yeah, all right, it. now, oh, the robot's oh, been hit. Oh, oh, my, oh my goodness, oh, goodness oh, the robot oh, was able to snipe the thing, and he got an opportunity. Get it, get it. All right, okay, oh, no, all right, oh, no. Okay, 12 to zero, and the robot is absolutely destroying humanity. I am the robot. Okay, all right, so... Okay, let's see if we can get around the corner here a little bit more. Oh. Okay, uh, 17 points to zero points. Uh, currently looking not terribly good for the future of the human. One point to the humans. All right, so I think we have a chance now. We just need to make out the 20 point uh, behind, 21 point behind 20. now. Um, so, okay, so the, okay, one of the things that the, uh, robot is, uh, the robot is forced to climb over the tank, but a uh, bit of a top tip, uh, you, you as a human can go through the tank. Um, yes! Uh, can go through the tank. Uh, yeah, two, two points. 32, oh. 30 seconds left on the clock. Oh, oh, oh. All right, can seconds. we come, come back on, from this? Are we able to secure oh. a future for the human race? 25 oh. seconds. Okay, all right, let's see what we can do. Come on, man. Okay. Only robot is to, oh, just, oh, no. The robot managed to flip its gun around behind itself. Okay, that's a trick that I've seen it do once or twice before. And 10 <laughs> seconds, nine, oh. eight, yeah. seven, Excellent. three points. Well done, humans. Okay, 50 That's to 3, good. 3, hey. 2, hey. 1, 4 points, and robots oh. win! Oh. <laughs> Big round of applause Give for a our hand human pilot. to James. Uh, also note, the uh, robot just kept killing cubes there. It doesn't even care at one. It has no feelings. It's still going. It's still going. Can I just point out, we had this slide ready. We didn't... <laughs> there was no yeah, competition. Yeah, we promise. Yeah. And yeah. a bigger round of applause for our robot overlords. So that's all our prepared content, and we have plenty of time for questions, or if anyone wants to have a go challenging yeah. the robot. You won't win. We won't win. You, you won't, won't win. win. You won't win. No matter how good you are. But we're hoping some people have questions because we would really love to hear your questions. So I think we... So we have microphones in the audience. Yes, we do. Um, and we have, yeah, so... Uh, where are the microphones, actually? They're in there. They're, oh, they're at the front. Oh, up here. Okay, brilliant. So if you have a yeah. question, please come oh. to the front, um, cool. and that way we can just uh, take questions there. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Hi. Hi. Is that working? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Cool. cool. Thanks for the talk. That was super exciting. Um, if we want to do that at our game studio, where do we start? 
the place to look is uh, Unity has a package called ML Agents that's on GitHub and that mm -hmm. contains all the documentation for this. Um, one thing that we have found is while this does look extremely organic, you have a bit less control over just the animation style. That said, this could look work really well for like high level planning stuff as well. So, so yeah. if you're using Unity, Unity, which, so for the, for the non-game developers, there's two big game engines which most of us are using, Unity and Unreal. Uh, Unity has released a thing called Unity ML Agents Toolkit, which is the thing that plugs into the almost ubiquitous framework that almost everyone's using for machine learning called TensorFlow, which lets you do this, which is what we're using. Uh, Unreal has not got anything official like that, but there's lots of projects that can let you tie it in. So yeah. you can more or less bolt any machine learning onto any game engine at this point, because stuff is extensible like that. But if you're using Unity, check out ML Agents. Yeah. Uh, and feel free to grab us afterwards, um, and we can yeah. talk to you directly about some of the stuff. So. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So you go over this side now, I yeah, guess? Why not? Yeah, why yep. uh, First of all, guys, really good job with the presentation. Thank you. It was Thank you. pretty awesome. Um, for someone who's in data science myself, I'm really interested in the sort of feature engineering that went behind your spider, actually. Um, so it's all good and well that you've been able to do the training set and get uh, the spider to move based on a whole set of features. But what was that feature engineering like? How did you go about designing those features so that it could work and operate? Um, so that's actually the real magic of reinforcement learning, designing those features. Uh, and it is definitely more magic. There's very little science in it. Um, in that you kind of just, uh, the way we've sort of worked is we have to, we, we sit down and we try and work out how we would currently do that if we were programming it like a normal AI. Then we try and translate that. So, um, so some things like uh, the walking's particularly challenging and that's based on a lot of work other people have done because the walking's really, really hard to work out how exactly to handle the joints. The gun was a lot simpler and we could work out exactly how that would work. We're literally just thinking it should get more points the closer it is to it and get a lot of points when it hits it. Uh, sorry, rewards, not points, minties. Um, but in the case of the walker, uh, it was really just looking at what other people had done. There's been a bunch of really great work by um, the OpenAI gym. Um, if you've looked into any of that stuff, there's been a bunch of really good work by Unity themselves into creating uh, walking robots. Uh, Punches Bears on Twitter has done some really great stuff with uh, fully AI corgis where they, he worked out how to teach them to walk. Um, but designing the reward schemes and making sure the actions make sense is what most of the work of this talk prep was. Um, how, how long did we spend sort of uh, going through designing? Uh, the design for uh, the control scheme for the robot was about, th about three days of work just refining exactly what information it was receiving, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, the the very first robot we made was too afraid of its gun, because uh, it got penalised for missing, and it was missing too much too early on, so it, that it, it never, never shot. Yeah, never fired. Because um, it determined having zero minties was better than negative minties. Um, <laughs> it turns out it's really easy to train an AI that is too terrified of the world to do anything, because if yeah. you get a penalty for doing the wrong thing and you get a reward for doing a good thing, but you stay at zero for doing absolutely nothing. A lot of the time, they'll just kind of stay there, slowly shaking. <laughs> Which is, I, that's my yeah, the mood, work. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. Uh, cool. cool. Uh, uh, you, me you mentioned the zero minties thing there, but when it came to developing, what other uh, bugs are the most interesting, or especially when it comes to creating a reward structure? So. <laughs> Generally, you can tell that a uh, that an agent has not been trained correctly or it has the wrong kind of reward structure when it looks completely different to what you're expecting. Like, when this is uh, failing to train properly, it basically sits there and just flails its legs up and down. The gun just pivots wildly around, and it looks completely unnatural. Like, it's really, really easy to spot uh, a, a, a badly trained AI. Um, I, yeah. I just mean for you guys, what was the most interesting bug you encountered? Oh, sure. Um, hmm. Well, uh, we actually have a bug right now where if you if you freeze the game and then uh, start it up again, well, then it actually well, why will... Why don't you just show them? Yeah, I don't have it in this demo, but... Oh. Um, um, but uh, uh, if, if time stops and then resumes for, the, for it, it kind of is horrified and curls up in a ball and rolls around. <laughs> I, my my favourite, not bug, but I guess learned behaviour was uh, when we were testing the, the multiplayer component, 
uh, the robot actually just walked over the player to get at the cube. Um, and yeah. that was just completely terrifying because you see this robot come over from behind the camera, yeah. walk over the top of you. It doesn't even care you're there. You're just you're the same as a rock to it. Um, um, one thing John might, might be able to show you, depending on where, how this is set up, is if you duplicate the robot, mm. they will start climbing on each other to have a better view of the battlefield. So yeah. they'll kind of like make a, make a pile of robots and then one yeah. will kind of ascend to the top and shoot everything. Going to make a bunch Which, of robots real they're quick, all independent. don't worry about they it. They can all just be duplicated because they've all got a brain and they can you, you can just clone them, which is great. All right, let's see how this goes. Okay. Um, His computer I'm, may also crash. Yeah, gonna, just, that cube has no chance. Yeah. Oh, no, that cube That cube is dead. All right. Actually, no, there's no guns on these ones. I, I, I turned right. the guns off, but yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. No. But yeah. It's not creepy at what, all. What tends to happen is they tend to converge on a single point because they're all trying to... Oh, hey. <laughs> but yeah, notice how they recover. That is... That's bananas. Um, they're able, yeah, they begin to crawl over each other. That's yep. One of them got pushed upside down. I'm just gonna try and fly in a bit close. Yeah. Uh, so what happened there was the robots are configured so that if the body touches the ground or any other obstacle, then we consider that it's upside down, rec unrecoverable. Reset it. So when when they uh, when they get hit by the wall or or something, yeah, this is uh, this has given me all, all kinds of bad feelings. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, they they interact with each other. Really. What, what, what's really interesting is none of these robots know anything about each other. They only know about the positions of um, the positions of their own limbs. Oh, so, as malicious as the cube sometimes looks, it's entirely random. Yeah, it's just like it just picks around. a random position yeah. and then moves to it at a fixed rate. Yeah. yeah. And again, like, I'm just always astonished because like the like. We just put these in the world and said, okay, learn to figure it out. Bye. And we came back five hours later and it was done. We'd be terrible parents is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, ba basically. I mean, that's how I understand it's done. So, cool. yeah, no, no specific more examples beyond that, but they, they do do weird stuff. It's fun to watch. We have a question. So let me go over here. Um, hey, guys. For hey. someone who's just starting with the MLAGES toolkit, what are some of the best tips or things to watch out for for beginners starting to use the MLAGES toolkit? That's a great question. Oh. That's a really hard one to answer. Um... um Make sure TensorFlow is working and configured correctly is actually, I would say, 90% of the bugs we have. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really easy to misconfigure TensorFlow. Um, then try and rebuild some of the Unity pre-made demos, because if you can't get them to work, you will have no chance of getting your own to work. <laughs> then you can start making your also, own Also, cool write stuff. down all your actions and observations and rewards on paper and think them through before you start designing the environment. That way you kind of know if they make sense or not. Um, uh, it's actually, very easy to make something that has a completely nonsensical reward scheme and is just going to end up weird. Also, uh, a, a slightly more uh, practical thing as well, it's really tempting to just say, oh, well, I'll tell the robot about everything in the, in, in the universe. I'll, I'll give it all the information that it could ever need. But that significantly complicates the structure of the internal neural network, and it means that the training time just goes through the roof. Like, four hours is um, a really short amount of time to train this. Also, uh, th these oh. really end up with like kind of natural-looking biological behavior, so they like kind of look like they're a creature. Whereas if you give them perfect awareness of their world, so if you give them information that the, the, the object wouldn't really know about, because you could put a camera in the sky that can see the whole battlefield, right? And you could give that information to the, the, the robot. And then that's not something the robot has unless it's kind of launched a drone or something weird. Uh, you will end up with something that moves in a much more artificial way. Whereas if you give them some information the way like a biological creature works, they will behave much more like a biological creature. Um, it's also worth pointing out their brains are about uh, five-ish thousand neurons and maybe a couple of million uh, synapses or connections between them. Uh, our brains several billion to several trillion depending on how you want to look at it um so like g giving them a lot more information like, like it takes a really like a human takes like 22 years or something before their brains like baked effective baked that sounds terrible fixed <laughs> done ready well, with apologies to um, those of you that are under 22 you're not yeah. ready yet yeah sorry yeah um <laughs> your brains aren't done wh wh whereas like that's because we need to be able to handle so much more input and solve more complex problems. The, the robot only needs to know how to walk. Um, so it can be sort of simplified, uh, which is why we can do this stuff in not real time yet, but like nearly real time. We did train the driving forward in real time, but yeah. So, just, so make them as simple as you can get away with. Just to piggyback off that question, if anyone is into data science or AI and hasn't started studying it yet or thinks it's intimidating, check out Unity and the machine agents, uh, machine learning toolkit. It's a really good way to get into this. It's not that intimidating. Right. So maybe go this side now.
Uh, yep. If you wanted to make it less jittery, the walking, um, how would you do that? Would you put a punishment on like leg movement? So or actually, what what we do uh, currently in this one is we only let it actually apply an action every ten steps. So every every frame, there's an opportunity for the neural network to feed back and say, "I want the joint to be here." And what we found is that actually leads to way more jitteriness. So a way that you would smooth that out would be to say, "Okay, um, only only try and make a movement uh, at you know, every every twenty uh, every twenty steps." Every 50 steps that makes it probably look a bit more um, more mechanical a bit more you know I am doing this one at a time um, um, the, and also smoothing out the values as well would also probably be useful as well uh, another thing is like spiders and even humans while, while we pretend we've got like these really rigid systems like all creatures uh, our, our bodies are kind of wibbly um, <laughs> So, so like we kind of have shock absorbers built yeah. into our flesh directly, which right. he can't. So yeah. some of his jitteriness is just because they're here. The, the physical setup here. of the body. It's smashing clean down with effectively like indestructible steel poles. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like even even as a, an actual spider, they're they're like uh, I believe they're like squishy fluid blobs yeah. inside or something. I don't yeah. know. Like I'm I'm not a spiderologist. Um, um, but, well, but they don't have this rigid sort of structure. So like they've got fluid mechanics and other sort of things that make them a little bit smoother. Mm. So while it's less exciting as well, if you were doing this in, say, a video game and not using it to simulate something for entertainment or for research purposes, you'd probably work with an animator who would half animate the thing mm. and then you would hook the machine learning up to something that kind of is partially animated and use the machine learning to drive the animation system. So it would be both a machine learning agent and an animated object that was driven half and half. Yeah. You'd probably like uh, make the AI give you the objectives. The machine learning would have the gun and you would have an animator manually create the legs. Yeah. Probably something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So Hi. Um, Hi. You were talking a little bit about the reward structure and how, how you set that up so that it optimizes the way you actually want it to, because one of our initial thoughts watching this was, like your example with the minties, OK, if you're optimizing for rewards, take smaller steps, more minties. Um, so how do you right. choose an appropriate structure? So, so that that's it's yeah. So that, that's why uh, one of the reward factors is velocity to target rather than are you closer? Okay. Yeah. So it, it actually gets more rewarded for moving quickly to the target than it is than it does just for being closer. Um, and I mean the gun example is a really good one, which we spoke about before, where their first training it was afraid to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, so we we actually just gave it more minties when it got a hit. Yeah. Just like we we just bribed it. Yeah, um. So like, we, we we basically made it clear that um, you will miss in the early stages of the training because in the early stages of the training, what happens is it effectively takes random actions. It's you know flipping a coin effectively, um, and that's not you know, you're going to miss all the time when you do that. And it was being punished for missing. So what we did was we 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 said when you do get a hit, you get uh, like if we're punishing you for one minty for a miss, we'll give you fifty minties for a hit. And eventually it begins to realize that, you know, missing can sometimes be okay because when you do manage to, like, zero in and get the hit, then that's, that, that, that overweighs. Now, we've used the metaphor of minties a lot. Really, it's just, like, a number being plugged into the equation, um, but it's a nice way to, like, kind of solidify that a bit. Yeah, so, you can't really have minties. Yeah, to be clear, minties. we're not giving it minties. Uh, <laughs> we're giving cool. it numbers, which are much tastier. Mm. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, Half precision floating yeah, point numbers. You mentioned before that, you know, you have a fairly... It's a, a few thousand um, nodes, so it's a fairly small network compared yes. to a brain, say. And so the number of inputs um, and probes is fairly limited. How do you choose those? And how do you defend against maybe giving, like if you've got a limited number of inputs, how do you defend against having some rogue that's completely destroying your, <laughs> your train? Uh, oh. um, really, the way you do it is you go, oh, whoops, that one isn't training well, is it? I guess we'll change our design. Like, trial and error is really the way that we designed this. Um, um, also, like, while it's not the most exciting thing, reading a lot of academic papers and, yeah. like, academic blog posts, they're like, I design my neural net like this. Um, it's like, we'll do that too, like, okay. Cool, all right, I will use that as the basis and tweak as needed. Like, convolutional neural neural layers. I'm like, I don't, I don't understand why they work, but everyone's like, use them for this. And I'm like, use them for that, and they work better than if I do it my way. So, like... Yeah. So some things I we do understand really well. Some things we're totally just guessing, and by reading other people's work, and from what I can tell, and talking to some of these luminaries in the field of machine learning, they're also just guessing and using other people's work. So we're all just guessing together. T Tim wasn't joking when he said it's more art than science sometimes. So yeah. there's obviously a lot of like science there, but really the, the art is the tuning to make it look right or do the thing you want it to do, and that's really just a numbers tuning game. That there's a reason every big tech company has vacuumed up every single AI researcher they can find. They're all trying to figure out what AI actually is. <laughs> uh, thanks. Cool. Did you 
do you consider uh, some of the effects of overfitting and whether the robot will perform in other environments? I mean, I see that it seems to be doing all right uh, with multiple spiders in there, an environment I presume it wasn't trained in. Did you look at other things like different obstacles or different speed or movement patterns of the cube? Yeah, in fact, that's the reason why the cube is moving around. Our very first attempts at this uh, were designed around, okay, can you approach the tiger, but the tiger wasn't moving. And it learned how to move forward, but it never learned how to turn. Um, so just to define the term, overfitting is where you train your agent to, uh, to solve the problem, but only the problem as presented, and there's no way for it to be flexible and learn how to solve slightly varying problems. So like if you train an image classifier uh, robot on, on pictures of cats, or it will only learn to recognize the pictures of cats that it's seen and never recognize pictures of cats that it hasn't. So um, yeah, basically our, our approach to, to just uh, preventing that problem is uh, add as much randomness to the environment as, as we could. The next step to this would be like to add uneven terrain, uh, just to vary the, basically add randomness to the, the size of the obstacles. Um, I, depending on how you'd want, how flexible you'd want this to, be, uh, to become, you could also do things like vary the length of the limbs uh, on the robot, so have them be small, be large, and, and learn how to deal with uh, having their bodies suddenly in horrifically changed shape. There, there, um, <laughs> there's a thing called curriculum learning, which is basically where you take the robot to school, and uh, the first year is like it learns how to walk, the second year is now we give it a gun, the third year is then we make it so the terrain rotates 90 degrees and it has to learn how to climb. And um, you yeah. give it perpetually ever increasing complexity. Uh, that, so yeah, we basically build robot school. You can also and, use uh, an entirely different learning technique called imitation learning or behavioral cloning where you, you as a human can drive the thing around and teach it what to do and it bases what it does off you which is also a whole lot of fun. Uh, actually, just on that point, uh, if anybody is familiar with uh, the Drivatars from Forza, um, like, no one? Wow, okay. So slow, slow nodding. Slow nodding, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so basically, uh, Forza, the racing game, uh, had this idea that you could uh, import a, an AI version of one of your friends and race against them. So basically, it was an AI trained to uh, drive like your friends drive. Um, which is really, really cool. They call it Drivatars. So basically, you could at any point like play against uh, your, your, your friend, or at least the digital uploaded clone of them, um, which, insofar as it could drive a car anyway. Um, and uh, that is done using uh, imitation learning, where basically it was recording how your friends drove when they were playing, and then uh, finessed an existing AI agent with that d data and then provided that to your game. And so basically you get effectively a good enough racing uh, driver that also will behave in similar ways. So yeah, there's a few different things you can do to, uh, with that. Cool. Right. Hi. Um, I noticed when you moved to put the gun uh, on the robot in the demo, you have put a lot of emphasis on the idea that these are two separate AIs and they're working independently to each other, they're just attached onto the, the body, the one model. Um, if those two AIs had been incorporated into each other, what would that look like? Would that be part of the reward structure, or how would you go about doing that? Right, so you could absolutely merge the two things together. The reason why we split them apart was one, so it's a cool talking point, and two, uh, the more things that an AI is being told to look at and to do, the more complex the network becomes yeah. and therefore the longer the thing takes to train. So that was right. largely a convenience for us. Yeah. If we'd trained one AI that could do both things, it could have taken several orders of magnitude longer to train it and get it right. Whereas if we did the two separately, we kind of had two controlled environments that we knew would work together. That said, it probably would have done a better job coordinating, yeah. but mm. it, like we trained, really, this was trained in about a day. Um, you'd be looking at probably a couple of weeks uh, training gets exponentially longer the more complex things get. Yeah, cool. yeah. The other thing is also you, because it only has one concept of reward, um, you would need to have some way for it to differentiate between reward for approaching target and reward for hitting target. And uh, it would sometimes like find a way. If it was easier for it to get rewards by approaching the target than it was to to shoot the thing, then what you'd end up, end up with is a robot that always approaches the target and never shoots it because that's what it's learned to do. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cool. cool. Hey guys, so this demo you're giving us here is completely within the Unity engine. Um, how much work is going on around, um, say for example, looking at a screen, working out what's going on and then applying AI to that? So you mean like having it view the view a, a picture of the environment and then making decisions based on that, like, like the way that we use our eyes to perceive exactly. the environment. So all the, all the observations that we're doing inside our example here are just numbers that we're feeding in from mm -hmm. the Unity engine objects that know about it. But Unity and the ML agents toolkit that we're using can actually do this with internal game cameras as well. 
So you can affix a camera to the top of the robot and then use that picture as the input on your neural net and give it no, no, no numerical observations at all. And you could probably get the same result by doing that. It would just take more time to train. Um, you could also fix a physical camera up to your computer and point that at something oh. and train it exactly the same way. Uh, open AI who's trying to build a general purpose AI, which, you know, good luck to them. Um, <laughs> Come on, they're not that good. Um, they they recently trained a world champion defeating Dota 2 bot, yeah. trained purely through just giving it real-time video footage. Yeah. It learned how to play the game. Uh, that took them months of training, though. Like, this is way quicker. Uh -huh. um, that, that it, like, it's exactly the same technique at its core. It, nothing changes. You just have to spend more time, have more GPUs to run it on, and uh, have more money. Um, is, is really the biggest like like the, like it sounds like I'm bagging them out. They've actually done such amazing work, and that is such a complex problem to solve. It, but it, at its core, it's it's all about how much time and money you want to invest. It, we, all our training was done on like the Radeon 580, whatever it is, inside John's laptop. And uh, you know, if we had like 3,000 2080s in a in a rack, then we could train all these things in like moments rather than hours. But you know, that's very expensive. Yeah. Amazon will sell them to you though, apparently. <laughs> cool. All right. Hi. Um, so obviously we've seen a lot of like tech companies and video game companies as well being really interested in this sort of artificial intelligence. Where do you actually see it being used realistically in a game context? Because I don't know about you, but the thought of you know fighting these guys, say in the next Call of Duty, kind of intimidates me a bit. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, Rome Total War Two uses neural nets to determine when units should run away or to stay in fight. Um, Supreme Commander 2 uses the neural net to determine if a battle's going to be worth... Sent. So, like, here's, here's the enemy units, here's my units, should I engage or should I flee? Uh, uh, Teresa Duringer at GCAP this week, if you were there, uh, gave a fantastic talk about writing a neural net for playing Race to the Galaxy, which is a card game. And it was so good they had to train a bunch of bad ones as well. Because, uh, like, they basically had an AI that said, come, bring yourself, I will thrash you. Uh, and then they had ones that were for... People who don't just want to get the pants beaten out of them by an AI. So yeah, exactly. what, what they had, had to do was uh, they take the output from the AI and uh, then have part of, uh, some of the code go. Actually, no, just make the decision worse, please. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, we don't like it very much when we get pounded. A lot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you can train them so they're not as good. So like to to your question of of uh, how do you see this being used in games? I would expect to see this being used in all of the background components, like. AI developers love having lots and lots of control over how the player is going to inter interact with the AI. Because the AI's job is not to defeat the player, it's to almost defeat yeah. the player. Um, and so that, that degree of control, uh, it's very, very hard to achieve that with this because we're training it to do good. And so it's very hard to say, but you're punished if you do super well. Like that yeah. just really confuses the training process. I think so. The next wave of this stuff you'll see is like when you know when, when back in the day when like Lord of the Rings started doing like the simulation for the crowds, and they kind of simulated all those enemies in the background of the movies. You'll see video games use these for like non super important things that need to flail around in the background, and there to be lots of them that kind of look like they're intelligent. And then eventually you'll see them be like the bosses, but not right now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Recently, I've seen a couple of articles about AIs people attempting to train AIs and the AI has gotten lazy. It's figured out what sort of output the um, scientist or whoever's programming it wants to see and has started spitting that out without actually doing a full analysis because it's been programmed yeah. to do it as quickly as possible. Have you ever run into something like that? Well, so just going back to what we said earlier about um, it learning uh, to either get the most reward from approaching the target rather than shooting. Like, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that, that you'd see. But like, there, there's some really, really funny stuff uh, that um, funny things that AI agents have done before. Like a, an agent that is designed to uh, adjust the shape of its body to be able to reach a target, it learned to just get really, really, really tall and then fall forward. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some... Um, I think I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the spreadsheet, but there's an amazing document that uh, is uh, collecting all the ridiculous stuff, including one that um, a, a tic-tac-toe uh, noughts and crosses bot that uh, learned how to crash its opponent and therefore win. Um, the, the main thing is AI don't think the way a human thinks. They don't think at all, really. Um, it, it's... If you set up a system so they can cheat, they will find a way of cheating. So the onus <laughs> is on you to make it so they can't cheat, um, which is really tricky. Uh, and, and there's no great ways around it other than guess and check. 
um, or wait to see if it's crashing opponents in, in noughts and crosses, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I just chime in for a second? We've got a time for about one more. All right. All right. Um, you said that uh, when they flip over or whatever, they can't turn back over, they reset. So did you ever leave them upside down for any extended period of time to see if they would figure <laughs> out a way to flip back? No, but that's actually not a bad idea. I might do that, honestly. We just went, you know, body touches the ground equals failure. Um, one of the problems with this is that uh, these robots don't have any concept of memory. They have, so uh, we, we give them information about the total amount of force being applied to each body part because it actually turns out that building memories uh, is not complicated, but it does complicate the, uh, the neural network. Like, it basically requires you to stack multiple copies of the network on top of each other uh, so that they can think in terms of what's happening now and what happened in the past. Um, and so if a robot is upside down, it will not know from frame to frame why it's upside down, and it won't be able to figure out a strategy uh, to do it. Um, so, yeah, worth trying, though. Worth, worth seeing like, just how it does it, and then if we realise that we have to add memory, then so be it. So cool. yeah. that's all we have time for. But you can find us in the corridor up here at the bit or find us on Twitter. If you are interested in being a game developer or a machine learning person, check this out. Machine learning with Unity is actually really simple. Don't be intimidated. Give it a go. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.